Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's program. My name is Devin Malone, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Today's program, Chosen Family, a conversation about queer friendships and art, celebrates the power of chosen family within the queer community and how these intimate bonds reverberate across queer culture and beyond. To share more about today's speakers, Kevin Aviance is a legendary drag queen, musician, and performance artist. His debut album, Box of Chocolates, introduced Kevin's hard-hitting sound with the club hit, Cunty, which was sampled by Beyonce on her song, Pure Honey. In 2015, Aviance received the Living Legend Award at the Glam Awards, and he is represented by Boss Management. Bo McCall, enthusiastically proclaimed by American Craft Magazine as the Button Man, creates wearable and visual art by applying clothing buttons onto mostly upcycled fabrics, materials, and objects. In 2021, he released his debut artist book titled Rewind, Memories on Repeat. Zakia Collier is a Black, Southern, queer, disabled archivist and memory worker based in Brooklyn, New York. She is a member of Shift Collective, where she supports communities in collectively developing cultural memory practices and designing sustainable programs to autonomously preserve and share their own stories. Last, but certainly not least, Saleo has been hailed as an icon of Harlem and Harlem's heart and soul. An acclaimed creative, curator, impresario, consultant, and muse, he seamlessly merges the worlds of art, fashion, literature, media, and music to document and amplify the stories of the emerging and underrepresented via exhibitions, events, and writing. Please join me in welcoming this wonderful group of panelists, and thanks again for attending today's program. Hi, I'm Solio, your guest curator and moderator for tonight's talk presented by the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, Stonewall National Museum Archives and Library, Leslie Lohman Museum of Art and SAGE. Today, we will discuss the power of chosen families in the queer community. On the screen, next slide, are photographs by Anthony and Tim Friedkin from the permanent collection at FAMSF. These photos documenting friendships in the queer community illustrate the concept of chosen family. Next slide, please. A chosen family refers to non-biologically related people who identify as a family based on chosen bonds and not biological ones. As we see in the photos, these close friendships often form some of the strongest bonds for those in the queer community and have led to the formation of houses and the ballroom scene, lifelong bonds, and the creation of art and archives documenting queer friendships. And now, please welcome our speakers, Kevin Aviance and Bo McCall. How are you? Hello, how are you? Thank you both so much for being here. It's such an honor. Thank you. Next slide, please. Bo, I want to start with you. So this is you with two members of your chosen family. So left to right, Antoine, a.k.a. Dee Dee Samore. Tracy Monroe in the middle, and then you on the end. Yes, correct. As Jeannie Holiday, right? Your drag name? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Many, many, many moons ago. <laughs> <laughs> and this is your collage that you created, Tributing Your Friends, which is in an exhibition at the Stonewall National Museum. Um, how did this chosen family of yours help you come of age as a young gay Black man in the 1970s? Well, we all lived in the same neighborhood. It was maybe about 10 of us. And you know how when you're out and about and you're walking down the street and you think you're the only one and then your, go your gaydar goes up and you see somebody who might have something in common with you. So we all sort of connected that way. And then we got introduced to one person and then the next person. And then eventually we became a family. We didn't know right then and there that we would become family, but we became family. Um, Tracy and Dee Dee, we started a punk rock band back then. I know all the kids were into um, disco at the time. And then as time moved on, um, the houses and stuff started um, forming. 
but we wanted to be pop punk. We wanted to be rock stars. We wanted to be rock stars. So we kind of rebelled against that. But we had a um a great relationship. Um we did everything under the sun. The three of us, we did it together. If we got in trouble, we all got in trouble. All the good times, we were all present at all times. So if, if you saw um one of us, you saw all of us. It just was an amazing friendship. It's just sad that I had lost them early on in life, especially Antoine. Antoine um, died in his 30s, and Tracy just recently died uh, in 2020. So, you know, I'm the only one left to continue the legacy and to tell our stories, which, you know, we had some amazing times together. And you certainly continue the legacy and telling the story through these beautiful collages. Um, and, you know, specifically Philadelphia, you know, conservative, 1970s, probably very much more conservative than it is even today. So how did this friendship really help you come out of your, your shell, so to speak? Well, I have two biological brothers, and I don't think <laughs> explaining to them that I was attracted to other men. <laughs> I don't know. We could have had that conversation back then. Um, you know, now, maybe now we could. But back then, that was damn near impossible. And I don't really think I could um, had the balls enough to approach them with, with those type of topics. But, you know, as I started meeting other gay friends and associates, um, it was like somebody that you could talk to and tell your deep, deepest thoughts to. And somebody that would understand what you were going through at the time. And especially being a young person, um, I, when I was growing up, I knew I was different. I didn't. I just didn't know what it was. I can remember being in the bed um, one night and I just was just crying like crazy. <laughs> My brother looked at me like, what in the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> I could not turn around and say, well, you know, I'm your older brother and I'm gay. <laughs> mm. So, you know, as time... Um, pressed on, you know, I met other gay folks and I began to, uh, you know, under, understand the lifestyle, understand the culture and um, try to uh, figure out my place within the culture. You know what I'm saying? Because at the time, you know, we were young, so it was all about fun. We, we wanted to dance. We wanted to go to parties. We wanted to go to clubs. We wanted to be seen. And at the time, Philly very small circle of um of the, the gay scene um it got old very quickly um and i needed um a fresh start so i left <laughs> i came to new york and and, and, left, and, and when you left on the next on the next slide is um ma renee <laughs> who created the dance classic miss honey yeah so now now, what role did Ma Renee play in your chosen family circle? Because when you moved from Philly to New York, you stayed for a time with Ma Renee. Right. So, um, Tracy and Anton lived on one side of the block and Renee lived up the block. So we were all like walking distance from each other. And I met um, Renee from Antoine. And when I first met him, he, he had this magnet, magnetic personality. He was somebody that when you saw him, you wanted to know who he was. He had he had a certain way that he walked down the street. He never held back the person he was and the person that he became to be, right? So uh, he was very creative then. Then I remember um, we went to the club and before MC Hammer wore his hammer pants, Renee had them on and he said they, was, they were called drum pants. That fool lit the club. <laughs> Up, and he made them. Um, he made them out of this um, sweatshirt material. Uh, and at the time, Norma Kamali was doing something similar to that, but not what he did. Um, and then he came up with this idea that we should move to New York. So, you know, he was very adventurous. You know, I'm, I'm still trying to find <laughs> myself as a person. So all I could start asking him all these questions like, where, we, where, where would we live? With, uh, how are we going to have an income? Are we going to have jobs <laughs> going to be available for us? It was like, no, 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 Miss Honey. Just come on. Just let go. We'll do it when we get there. I was like, not I. 
not I. So I would not, I didn't go. So he was here maybe um, five years before I arrived in New York. And when I got to New York, I made a pit stop in Newark and it didn't work out. And I called Renee and, you know, explained to him my situation. And he was like, oh, you know, come stay with me. So I stayed with him for maybe five or six months. And he was a, what I call a celebutine at, at, at the time. He was hosting all these gigs at all these different clubs, mainly um, Midtown 43 at the time. And everywhere we went, everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew his name. And then he greeted everybody with, hi, love juice. Hi, love juice. Hi, love juice. <laughs> <laughs> he was just an amazing person. And he was and one of the first people I knew that was creative. And he understood my creativity. I think, yeah, and that's so important to have someone who understands your creativity. And Kevin, you were also friends with Ma Renee. And um, <clears throat> on the screen, next slide, are images from your various albums and singles. How did your relationship with Ma Renee as a member of your chosen family inform your creative practice as a drag queen musician and performance artist? I started coming to New York City, um, doing it through uh, going to the limelight, becoming a club kid first. And I would see Warrene before she got to the club. And she would either be in some sort of outfit or like, you know, some sort of, um, you know, tape from the street, like the, 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 the tape, like do not enter the, the orange tape wrapped around her body in some way. Or, or I remember one time she had this umbrella, this really sickening umbrella. It was a huge umbrella. All night long she carries the umbrella around. Um, it was. I looked up to her. I looked up to her so much. She was my idol. I. I was. Um, I was obsessed with Mariah um, Carey. She was hosting the all the parties for Junior Vasquez, and I remember one time when Junior Vasquez went to the world, the world, and she had the world in her hand, like the, the little uh, globe in her hand. That was the world, and it was one of those hard ones from school. And I remember she said, "I carry the world in the palm of my hand." <laughs> And now it's yours. And she threw it in the audience to somebody. To, it didn't bounce or anything. And they threw it back at her. She threw it back at them. It was amazing. She's wow. an amazing person. She was an amazing show. Amazing. Oh, my God. This queen was amazing. Amazing. So it's, it sounds like you got some of your high energy and fashion sense. A little inspiration from Marvin A. Is that safe to say? Um, I, I guess it would be like, you know, all queens mm -hmm. have a certain like a a certain thing that happens that, that, that makes all like be performers or whatever kids be. But I was mostly like the way she hosted parties. Mm -hmm. That's what I really like obsessed with. Was Love obsessed with her about. She hosted parties and everybody knew her. She was so sweet, and so nice, and and or maybe just fierce. She was just fierce, you know. Yeah, I love that. And next slide on the screen is an image, Kevin, of some members from your current chosen family. Um, as a member of the House of Aviance, you're part of a large chosen family. How do you think these chosen families or houses in the ballroom scene help members of the queer community navigate the marginalization we face in society? Oh my God, I just, this question is so fierce. Um, First of all, that, that gentleman I'm sitting next to in the white one, he discovered me. A lot of people like to say that this person discovered me or Junior Vasquez discovered me. With This man, Juan Williams, uh, mother Juan, she discovered me, gave me the strength to, uh, to, to be able to do what I needed to do, um, the support. Um, I, we had a house, an actual house that we lived in in D.C. on, on 14th and Euclid and um, 14th and Harvard, sorry. And... Um, it was amazing, amazing time, you know. I, I, I'm so gratefully indebted to my family to to pick me up because I didn't really know what that was all about. I was coming up from Richmond, Virginia. My family never kicked me out of my house. Uh, I chose to leave. Um, <laughs> it was just I had eight brothers and sisters, and um, it was just one of those things where I just had to get out. I was done. And when the family had money, the, we had a great house. Uh, I had everything I wanted, but I just was I wasn't happy there, and. I wasn't happy there because I was gay and um, it was just like, you know, I was rebellious, you know, I was really like living out and relaxing my hair and da -da 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 and carrying on and just trying to be everything I didn't want to be in Richmond, Virginia. I wanted to be something different, you know? And um, yeah. So when I found my family, 
or they found me. And uh, instantly, I, I felt strong. I felt I felt protected. I felt um, I felt great, you know. And when you're going into the community, the gay community, it can be like a little rough, you know what I mean? And um, I've never been told no. And I, it's growing up and stuff like that. When it came to, I can have whatever I want. But you know, some people don't feel like that that way in the community. And I don't really listen to any of that. But you know, I just went for what I had to get and got what I had to get. Period. Point blank. I love that. And I love that for both of you, you know, we hear a lot of stories about how, you know, sometimes biological families kick out their queer, their queer children. And for both of you not being kicked out, but still needing to have that space of those who were like-minded, who you could identify with on a different level was so important. I think that's a piece of having a chosen family, particularly in the queer community, that is really crucial, right? You need people who are creatively like-minded or just understand what it is to be a gay Black person, right? Uh, who, li with th who live it as well. Um, so for both- Yeah, I enjoyed, I really enjoyed church. Church was, a, I felt very safe at church. Church was oh, amazing wow. for me. So church was very like, I felt comfortable at church. Church was the place I could go and it was great. You know what I mean? And once I left church, I was like, we're gonna go to the mall or go home. <laughs> it's crazy, it's crazy. You don't hear that a lot, that church was a place of comfort for, for queer. Yeah, I love my church. My church was amazing. Yeah. Wow. Well, it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. I went to Catholic school. and oh, okay. Church is very dull and boring. You know, they do these little hymns and mumble and stuff like that. It wasn't the Black experience where you got that tambourine and, you know, yeah. you got rhythm in your soul. It was not that. So I was not impressed by it. And, you know, for, for both of you, having you know, the bonds you formed through your chosen family. When you look at the LGBTQ plus movement as a whole, how do you think these bonds strengthen the entire movement? And we can start with either one of you, Kevin, Bo. I think um, this, the word strengthening is it's kind of weird because, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it strengthens you to be around who you want to be around or who you can relate to more, you know what I mean? Because they're more like you. Um, and then you find yourself out there with the community and you don't feel like you're being accepted. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. with the gay, with the other gay boys that, that are not black or, you know, or other colors or other races and stuff. And so it was, it was always a thing of mine to bring other people together and, and, and to work with other people and bring them into the, to the punk's way of it all. You know what I mean? I, I tried very hard to, you know to make sure that I was communicating with a lot of people and um, everybody likes you, you know what I mean? So um, whenever negativity came around, I just turned around and walked away, you know what I mean? And there was a lot of negativity, of course, um, mm -hmm. towards me. Um, yeah, because they didn't understand me. I mean, I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, wasn't, you know, I wasn't a normal drag queen, you know what I mean? <laughs> so no tits, not tucking, everything like that, you know, it was crazy, you know? Well, all the more reason how important it was that House of Aviance accepted you. Um, and Bo, did you have any thoughts on how like chosen family strengthened the LGBTQ plus movement at large? I can relate to what Kevin is saying. Um, you know, when I started um, coming out and hanging with different groups of different queens and stuff, at that point, nobody got along with each other. So if I was with one group, it would be exclusive to them. I couldn't run back to my other group and discuss what we discussed. It was kind of hectic. And then I felt like, I still felt like an outcast when I was in the gay atmosphere. Like when I went to clubs, I wasn't really a dancer. I, I didn't really catch on to all the slang and the, and the lingo. That just wasn't in my DNA. I am who I am and you take it or leave it. And a lot of times they, they left me. <laughs> so well, I think I think you're both raising interesting points, right? Because the LGBT community is not monolithic, right? It's not just one type. There's people right. who are into different things. And so it's like, you know, with any family, there's family dysfunction, right? But all the more reason why it's important to have your own chosen family, your own group that you can identify with, even amongst the larger community. Right. Um, so I think that's a good point. Um, quick question. 
What do you think we can learn from these chosen families about the power of love and about what it means to be family? Because so often society defines family as just your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, whatever. How do you think how the queer community approaches family demonstrates something different about love and the concept? Well, I, I, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. To me, I think it's a little different now because of social media. Because a lot of these kids, they meet each other in front of a camera. And then they come out and then they formally meet each other. We didn't have that privilege. You can't. You came out. You got your ass out. Walked the streets. You hung. Well, when I came to here, you hung on the pier. Philly, we hung in, hung on Thirteenth Street. You met people hands on. You were in their face. You had conversations. You did things. You socialized. It's a little different now. Um, I would just say it empowered me to know it was other people like me. Right, not in the sense that we were identical in thought and in, in motion as we moved about, because it was it was a few eyeballs that stuck out amongst the sea, and those people, you still got ridiculed. Because I can remember lots of parties was going on. I, I felt like, you know, I was mildly popular, but I didn't get invited to none of the parties. I wasn't offended. I just felt like I knew that they didn't understand my brand of what I was presenting with community so right now it's th th these kids th they are a little more open they have a little they have a lot of um a lot more alternatives than we did right mm -hmm. and kevin how do, what do you think we can learn from chosen families about the power of love well you know my 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 family is we see we're given the name and we are told to do as we please with it in the sense of like where we want to go in our lives so a lot of times my family i didn't really get close to them i knew juan i knew a couple other people but i was always on the road performing and doing my thing so they came out for my shows and stuff so it got to a point where i was kind of like ah, they were asking questions are you really in the house of aviance because you don't go to our meetings you don't do the da 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 you don't do the and I had to tell them, I said, I'm more happy than you'll ever be, honey. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, so it, it got to the point. Now it's a little bit different because we are, we're very close. Things are old. I mean, we're older now. And we really, with COVID, it happened and stuff like that. I really love seeing the people that are from the past and see the ones that are still alive and, 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 and we can be together. I personally think uh, the, 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 the it can be good and bad, the house thing, you know what I mean? Being in being in these chosen families, because um it can be a power a power trip, you know what I mean? It could be they, they could be telling you just to do what you need to do and you're listening to that stuff and might be stifling you from do what you really want to do. So you gotta be open, you have to be you have to voice your opinion about things, you know what I mean? You can't be quiet or they're going to, you know, bombard you and take over you, you know what I mean? Just like any mother and father does, you know. Well, thank, I appreciate um, you. There was one thing when someone told me, they said, they said, you know, they said, we we have responsibilities because we we are all somebody else's babies. Do you know what I mean? So we have a responsibility to take care of each other and to look out for each other to make sure that we get back to our original family, you know, and the family knows that they're safe with this family, you know? So. I love that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, mm -hmm. At this time, I want to bring on Zakia Collier. Um, who's an archivist and memory worker. Um, Zakia, you can come on camera, please, please. Um, may you please share with us some of the work you do to help organizations and communities document and preserve these stories of chosen families so that future generations can learn from and be inspired by these bonds. Absolutely. Thank you, Solio. And uh, thank you, Bo and Kevin, for your comments. I was back here behind behind the scenes getting emotional thinking about my own chosen family. So just thank you so much for uh, the way that you love and are loved within your families. Um, and so I'm going to talk briefly a little bit about my work um, and some things that I do and that others can do uh, to really document the beauty of these families that we've built. And um, I like to say that my chosen families have saved my life. And so um, I want other people to know and see what that looks like. Um, so next slide. 
So here is, um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of different formats um, that we might be able to work with in doing this preservation work. So one being zines, um, you know, zines are not out of style. They've gone in and out, they've come back into the light. Um, all the kids are doing them and they really are a beautiful place to bring together a lot of different ideas and thoughts. Um, and also the voices of individual people um, about their experiences. And this uh, is just um, an image from a zine that I worked on about Black mental health um, within queer and trans communities, um, interviewing my own friends about their uh, perspectives and experiences with mental health. Uh, next slide. And so for this uh, particular zine, I just interviewed and recorded conversations with my friend. This one is uh, from um, my lovely friend Jasmine, who uh, talks a little bit about uh, the child abuse she experienced and how that impacted her mental health um, and in her uh, sort of upbringing. Uh, next slide. Here is another zine um, that I actually collectively created uh, with a, um, a queer organization named Safe Forest Society um, in 2019, um, where I brought together uh, many people for a workshop to talk about archiving. And we kind of talked about our experiences, our dreams, what will we tell our younger selves, our descendants um, of all queer descendants, chosen descendants, um, and so kind of brought together different uh, perspectives there. Next slide. Um, letter writing. So here is um, uh, some letters that were published between um, my, my foremother, Audre Lorde, and, and Pat Parker. Um, that And so I think it's just incredibly important for us to think about documenting our letters and getting back to letter writing. Um, I'm a little like anti-technology sometimes and I'm like, write me a letter, write me a card and um, think about documenting the, 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 your side of the letter too, right? So taking a picture or scanning the card before you send it um, so that this full story can come together at the end and you can see your side and, and your friend's side when they wrote you back or your family um, and what that actually looks like. What is this love story, um, this family story look like um, in, a, in a beautiful sort of back and forth correspondence. Um, next slide. And here um, is just uh, an example of how I myself document my own chosen family and friends. Um, so. I have a couple of collections of my friends that I just collect by going to their events and taking flyers and taking pictures of the posters or stealing the poster off the wall sometimes um, because I, I support and love my family down. And so it's really important to, um, to keep these things because sometimes after these events, after you're hosting something or your friend and family is hosting something, things get thrown out. Um, yep. And no one's thinking about, you know, the future, the history of this person who's so important to you. Um, so this is just like, I have Google Drives on my friends and family. I have physical file folders on them. I'm keeping your publication. I'm keeping the poster. I'm taking the screenshot. <laughs> and if you're looking for it, I probably have it. If you're looking for that piece of history about yourself, I probably got it. So. Um, um, just want to uh, encourage everyone to really think about um, keeping and taking the things that that represent your relationship, keeping those photos um, and being intentional behind these decisions and the things that you decide um, to take part in and, and remembering that you're going to want to remember that in a particular way. Um, and so collaborating with your chosen family to document your full histories and your community. Thank you so much. Um, and at this time, I wanna go through a few photo submissions. We asked viewers to submit photos of members from their chosen family and explain what they mean to them. So next slide, please. So Ruben Natal San Miguel uh, submitted this photo of him with RuPaul's Drag Race star, Angina. And on the right is a photograph he created of Angina. 
For Ruben, his friendship with Anjana has taught him the importance of embracing, supporting, and defending drag, which is currently under attack in America. Plus, this friendship inspired him to photograph and document Anjana and ensure that the drag legacy is represented in permanent collections at various institutions. Next slide. Jake Alferi submitted this photo montage which hit with his friends, Muhammad, Nikki, and Youssef. When asked about his chosen family, Jake said, these three people never stop helping me be my true self. And the joy that comes with that truth can't be measured in words. I agree. Oh. And final slide. Um, Pamela Booker submitted this photo of her with friends Linda and Diana. When asked about her chosen family, she said, quote, Linda was my first when we were young journey women. Our love never separated, but evolved and expanded over the decades. And with Diana, her dear wife, they are my divine gifts, end quote. Oh, oh isn't that sweet? <laughs> sweet. Um, a special thank you to our audience, our speakers, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco team, and our co-presenters, Stonewall National Museum Archives and Library, Leslie Lohman Museum of Art and Sage. Um, please visit famsf.org for updates on future events. And good night. Thank <laughs> you.